Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us. We're getting ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today. Numbers chapter 25 verse 9. And we saw Balak, the king of Moab, uh, fearful of the people of Israel. And... uh, fearful that they were going to destroy him and his nation like they destroyed the Amorites, which were a Canaanitish people. And uh, he hired, Balak hired Balaam to come and curse the nation of Israel. And after three attempts, uh, ever moving closer and closer to where Israel was encamped, uh, I think they gave up on plan A. Uh, Balaam told Balak on more than one occasion, I can't speak what the word I of my own accord. I can only speak what the word of the Lord. Well, they gave up on plan A, which was for Balaam to curse the nation of Israel. Plan B was to have the Midianites and the Moabites seduce Israel into idolatry and then someone who is fully capable of cursing Israel, uh, the Lord would curse them. And that's what we saw happening at the beginning of chapter 25. The people of Israel started worshiping Baal and uh, made God very angry. And um, he instructed Moses to gather the judges and to kill all of those who were caught Uh, worshiping Baal and to impale them on a pole. And about that time, uh, Phinehas, uh, the uh, son of Eleazar, who's the high priest at this point in time, witnessed an Israelite going into his tent with a Midianitish woman, and they were going in to, to have fornification. And uh, Phinehas grabbed a javelin, a spear, if you will, and took it into the tent and ran him through into the ground in the very act. Uh, Once again, a priest interceding, uh, appeasing the wrath of God, and the plague stopped. And that's where we left off. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Let's go with Numbers chapter 25, verse 9. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, uh, Paul uh, states that twenty-three thousand died. I think the difference is the twenty-four thousand here in Paul's writing of twenty-three thousand is that there were some who were slain by the judges of Israel and impaled on a pole, I think approximately a thousand. The message to the people, don't commit fornication. Verse 10, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and there's a covenant going to be made uh, between the Lord and Phinehas, who is the son of Eleazar the high priest the grandson of Aaron, verse 11. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, and there is no word in the Hebrew language for uh, grandson or grandfather, Uh, better said the grandson of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath, God speaking, away from the children of Israel, what the priest should do, be a mediator, Uh, between God and the people. While he was zealous for my sake, in the Hebrew, this is uh, with my zeal, the Lord speaking, uh, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. 
Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, we learn that uh, God states, Thou shalt worship no other God uh, before the Lord, whose name is Jealous, with a capital J. He is a jealous God. He doesn't like it when his children, and you are one of his children, whether you act like it or not, uh, but when his children go whoring, uh, after other gods, small g, uh, it makes him very angry. Verse 12, Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and uh, to grant what was promised in the covenant that follows, is what this is about. Verse 13, And he shall have it, the covenant, in other words, between God and his seed after him, to, to remain in his seed line, the children of Phinehas, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now, this covenant was only briefly uh, interrupted. Uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. Uh, at the time Samuel was uh, born and very young in and around the temple, there was a high priest by the name of, of Eli. And Eli had, uh, Eli was of the tribe of, or the family of the Levites uh, that were descended from Ithamar, not from Eleazar, which was the covenant was made with Phinehas, is my point. Um, that uh, didn't last very long because they were uh, the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were crooked priests. Uh, they were making it to where uh, when someone made an offering to the Lord, what was the Lord's, and the fat is something that belongs to God, they would send their servants around and say, well, the, the priest would have meat today. And, and cut it a little extra thick with the fat still on it because that's the way the priest liked their steaks. Uh, and then the offerings that the people were to partake of themselves uh, in a sacrificial meal, which is a, a communion with God, they were ripping the people off. That's the peace offerings uh, was a portion of it was the offerers to eat with his or her uh, family and friends if they chose, whoever they invited to partake of it. And they would send a young man around with a flesh hook and sink it into the seething or the boiling meat and take out what was belonging to the offerer for their own use. Uh, it got to the, the point where it was so bad they were lying carnally with the women who came to serve in and around the temple. Uh, that didn't last very long. It made it to where the offerings became an abomination to the offerers and to God himself. So uh, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, were killed. The Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines. And Eli, when he heard of that, uh, fell off of his stool backwards and broke his neck. Uh, then the priest line was back under Phinehas, or Eleazar's seed line. Verse 14, Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Medianitish woman caught in the very act, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. Now, a prince of the people, a leader of one of the tribes, is supposed to set a good example for the people, not a bad example for the people. Uh, we're going to see that the Simeonites, of who Zimri was a member of, uh, probably made up quite a considerable percentage of those 24,000 who died in the plague. If their leader was doing it, so those who were uh, see him and follow him were doing it as well. Verse 15, uh, sharpen up for me. And the name of the Medianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, uh, the daughter of Zur. He was head over a people, 
and of a chief house in Medan. Now, Cosby, and if you translate it rather than transliterate it, means false. Zur, a word most of you are familiar with, if you translate it, is rock. So what, and, and you know, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, I mentioned a few moments ago about 23,000 were killed. If you follow on down in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Paul states that these things, referring to these very people that we're studying about, uh, these things happened as an admonition, as a warning is what that means to those of us who will live in the end times. That's this generation. Uh, what's the warning from these people? In this case, Cosby is false, Zur uh, is rock. Beware of the false rock. Beware of false gods. You know, our God is jealous and uh, those who Jesus finds in bed spiritually with Satan, the false rock of Deuteronomy chapter 32, the song of Moses, our rock is not their rock. So beware of the false rock. God's name is jealous. Don't go whoring after other gods is the lesson. Verse 16, And the Lord spake unto Moses, excuse me, saying, now, we learned that uh, Balaam was not very high on God's list. And we learn in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, uh, Christ speaking to the church of Pergamos. And he said, I have a few things against thee. Uh, your doctrine is the same as of Balaam, who became a stumbling block to Balak. And that is the way God looked on what Balaam had done. We're kind of finishing up here the history of Balaam and Balak until we get to chapter 31. But God is not going to let it go what Balaam did to cause Israel to fall into idolatry. And he's going to hold him accountable when we get to chapter 31, um, verse 8. He's, he's, he's called to account for seducing Israel into idolatry and apostasy. Verse 17, the instructions of the Lord, vex the Midianites and smite them. This means to, to fight them and, and completely wipe them out. Why? Because of plan B to seduce Balaam, uh, Balaam's plan to seduce Israel into worshiping the gods of the Midianites and the Moabites. Verse 18, for they vex or they afflict you with their wiles, with their deceit, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Median, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. And this, their sister, meaning she was, uh, they were a member of, she was a member of their tribe. Now, consider this generation that is currently living. We're, we're, we're some 38 years after the first numbering and for easy figuring let's say 40 years is the length of time that Israel was to wander in the wilderness. And you see those who were 20 years old and upward at the time of the first numbering in chapter 1 of Numbers have passed away. Uh, there are a few remaining uh, there would be uh, Caleb and Joshua who were the only ones over uh, that age at the time who re would remain alive and enter the promised land. So, but you have a generation here, a new generation that were 19 and under at the time of the first numbering. So uh, God preparing them to move into the promised land. What we're going to see in chapter 26 is uh, and and you, you, you saw God's instructions in those last verses to wipe out the Midianites and to uh, smite Moab, which was a prophecy back in uh, chapter 24. And to do that, you need an army, and it's time to muster the troops. 
Now this is going to be a little bit slow in that we're going to be talking about each of the tribes of Israel again and what their numbering, their count was at this time. But this was a very important count to the people of Israel. Why? Because the allotment of land was going to be determined by how many people each tribe had. The more people you have, the more land, percentage of the land of Canaan, uh, your tribe received. And, uh, you know, God set up the allotment of land based on this tribe will have this land, this tribe will have that land. And he also set up a method whereby that would never change in that every 50th year was known as a jubilee year. And all possessions of land went back. I don't care if you sold your land or you actually couldn't sell your inheritance, but you could uh, lease the, the, the produce. In other words, if, if someone didn't want to farm the land, they could charge someone for the use of the land and then they would plant the crops, tend the crops, harvest the crops, and uh, reap the benefit. But at the year of Jubilee, all of those type of contracts were null and void and everything went back to the way it was when God uh, made these decisions concerning the allotment of land. Let's go with chapter 26, verse 1. And it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, Eleazar, of course, the high priest now, we saw the death of Aaron recorded back in chapter 20, verse 2. Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward, those who are capable of fighting, in other words, old enough to go to war. Throughout their father's house, all that are able to go to war in Israel. In this generation, the older generation by this time for the most part had died out and this is a totally different numbering than what we saw in chapter 1. The only two who were numbered of the 603,550 fighting men in uh, chapter 1 of the book of Numbers, the only two who would enter the promised land, as I said earlier, Caleb and Joshua. Why were they allowed to? Because when they sent the 12 spies into the land of Canaan to check it out, the other 10 made up a false report, a slanderous report. You remember they said, well, we can't go in there and defeat those people. They're giants there and we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Caleb and Joshua, the only two who said, God said, that's our land. Let's go get it. Verse 3. And Moses and Eleazar the priests spake with them, the heads of the tribes, in other words, in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, now we're getting very close to the promised land. Uh, Jericho in Joshua chapter 6, uh, that was the first uh, city after Israel uh, crossed the Jordan that uh, the Lord demolished for them. You remember uh, they blew the trumpets and they marched around Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. <clears throat> Verse 4, Take the sum of the people, or the count of the people, from twenty years old and upward, as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5, The oldest son of Jacob, the firstborn Reuben, the eldest son of Israel, or Jacob, the children of Reuben, Hanok, Hanok, the same is the word, the name Enoch in the book of Genesis. Now, I'm not saying this is the same person, but he has the same name in the Hebrew language, Enoch. And whom cometh the, of whom cometh the family of the Hanokites, uh, of Pelu, Pelu means distinguished, the family of the Paluites. And 
we notice first uh, difference here from the numbering in chapter 1. In chapter 1, the tribes were not divided into the major families as we see they are here. Of Hezron, which means courtyard, the family of the Hezronites. Of Carmi, which means gardener, the family of the Carmites. And I would imagine after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that the people would be looking forward to having a homeland where they could have a courtyard and perhaps a garden. Verse 7, these are the families of the Reubenites, and they that were numbered of them were forty and three thousand and seven hundred and thirty. Forty-three thousand seven hundred and thirty here. Uh, Reuben numbered forty-six thousand five hundred in the first numbering confound in the book of Numbers. So diminished slightly. Uh, we're going to see some such as Simeon uh, were diminished greatly. But you see, the children uh, are a blessing from God. I hope you consider your children, if you are blessed with them, to be a blessing to you. Uh, that's the way God looks at it. Uh, there's a, a book in the a chapter, I should say, in the book of Leviticus that uh, if you think God doesn't bless and curse, you need to read Leviticus chapter 26. Uh, for in verse 9, uh, God sits there, states there that if you do things my way, I will multiply your children. You know, children are a blessing from God. But then he follows in verse 22 that if you walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you, the Lord speaking. And he said, if you walk contrary to me, don't do things my way, I'll send wild beasts among you who will rob you of your children. Verse 8, And the sons of Pelu, Eliab, and these families mentioned um, by division, and the, again, the, the allotment of land would be by these major families is the reason we see the major families mentioned by name where we didn't see them in chapter 1. And the sons of Eliab, Nimuel, uh, and Dathan, uh, and a Abiram, this is that Dathan and Abiram, if these names seem familiar to you, this is why, which were famous or well known and not for a good reason in the congregation who strove against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah when they strove against the Lord by questioning uh, the authority of Moses and Aaron. You remember they said, uh, you take too much upon you. Uh, the people of Israel are holy and you uh, have put yourself in a position that you lord or, or you're the prince or the king over the people of Israel. You appointed yourself to be the king over Israel, but that's the problem with Korah's thinking was that it wasn't Moses and Aaron who appointed themselves, God appointed them to lead the nation of Israel and the priesthood respectively, verse 10. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when that company died what time the fire, the fire of the Lord, devoured 250 men, and they became a sign. These are the 250 who dared to offer incense in their censers before the Lord, and that fire uh, completely consumed the 250, and it was so hot it melted their censers. You may recall Eleazar the son of Aaron was instructed to gather the censers that were melted because they were holy and they beat them into plates and attached them to the sides of the altar of burnt offering as a sign uh, to those uh, of future generations. Verse 11, notwithstanding the children of Korah died not. Now in chapter 16 verses 26 and 27, Moses 
at God's instruction, told the people to move back away from Korah and the Reubenites. And it's obvious by this phrase that some of the sons of Korah uh, followed God's instructions and separated themselves. And it's easy to document that in the book of Psalms, uh, you have some of the more well-known and respected uh, Levitical musicians. They're called singers in the book of Psalm, but musicians covers it probably better were the sons of Korah. <clears throat> Verse 12, the sons of Simeon, you remember this is the one that Zimri was a prince of, the one who was messing around with the Medianitish woman. The sons of Simeon, after their families of Nimuel, Nimuel means day of God, the family of Nimuelites, uh, of Jamin, which means right hand, the family of the Jamanites and Yaquin. Yaquin means he will establish. Uh, you remember when Solomon's temple was built, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 21. The right pillar was named Yaquin, which means he will establish. The left pillar was named Boaz, in it is strength. The family of the Yaquinites, verse 13. And Zira, Zira means rising of light, the family of the Zarhites, of Sheul, which means asked, the family of the Shaulites. Verse 14. These are the families of the Simeonites, twenty and two thousand two hundred. Twenty two thousand two hundred, uh, their count in the first numbering in chapter 1 verse 23 was 59,300. So uh, greatly diminished and again I think the reason was because of the sin of the Simeonites at the time that they were uh, seduced by Balaam and Balak to worship the gods of the Medianites and the Moabites. Verse 15, the children of Gad, after their families of Zephon, uh, uh, which means watch or called, the family of the Zephonites of Haggi, which means festive, uh, the family of the Haggites, and Shuni, the family of the Shunites. Shuni means rest or quiet. The Smith's Dictionary uh, translates it fortunate. Verse 16, of Osni, the family of the Osnites, and of Eri, the family of the Erites. Eri, again, meaning watchful, uh, and uh, Osni means having uh, quick ears. Uh, verse 17, of Arod, which means fugitive, if you translate, the family of the Aradites and Arioli, uh, means heroic, the family of the Arielites. Verse 18, these are the families of the children of Gad according to those that were numbered of them, 40,500. They numbered 45,650 in uh, chapter 1, verse 25. A uh, slight uh, decrease, but really insignificant, only 150 uh, persons less. Verse 19, the sons of Judah were Ur and Onan. Uh, Ur means watchful again, a form of ur I we had earlier, and Onan, which means strong. And Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. Now, uh, what had happened there was Judah, <coughs> excuse me, the patriarch of the tribe of Judah, uh, took a Canaanitish wife, and these were, actually there were three sons of the Canaanitish uh, woman that Judah had, Ur, Onan, and then one that was much younger. Uh, what happened there was, uh, you see, God was protecting, Judah was the seed line through which Messiah was to come, 
and God always protected that seed line. He could not have descendants of a Canaanitish woman in the seed line through which Christ would come. Uh, and, and what happened there was uh, God uh, killed Ur and Onan. Uh, Tamar, uh, who was uh, the, the daughter-in-law of Judah, uh, Judah gave the younger son to her, but he was too young for her at the time. So they sent Tamar back to her land uh, to wait for them to call when the third son was old enough the call never came. God protecting that seed line. Verse 20, And the sons of Judah, after their families, were of Shelah, Shelah means request, the family of the Shelanites, and Pharez, Pharez means to break or breach, uh, that would be the seed line through which Christ would come, uh, Judah through Pharez and then down through the umbilical cord through David unto um, Mary, the mother of Jesus. The family of the Pharisites and Zerah, uh, the family of the Zarhites. And Pharez and Zerah were twins who were eventually born to Tamar, uh, the daughter-in-law of Judah. And the sons of Pharez were Hezron, Hezron means courtyard again, the family of the Hezronites of Hamul, uh, the family of the Hamulites. So the Strong's Concordance translates Hamul as pitied, uh, Smith's Bible Dictionary, surrounded by a wall. Verse 22, these are the families of Judah according to those that were numbered of them, Three score and sixteen thousand and five hundred. Uh, Seventy six thousand five hundred fighting men, twenty years and old of Judah. The account back in chapter 1, verse 27, was seventy four thousand six hundred. Uh, by far the largest tribe at the first numbering and also remained the largest tribe at the uh, second numbering. Judah, as the blessings of Jacob would be in, in Genesis chapter 49, uh, Judah would always be a champion of their brethren. Well, we'll come back, and I know this is a little bit slow, but uh, keep in mind how important this numbering was to the people of Israel at this time because uh, the divisions of the promised land were based on how many people were in each tribe. The more people, the more land. So we'll come back and finish this numbering and, and see what else this book of Numbers has in store for us in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back to the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, uh, the United States, and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to ask to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Uh, throwing out a negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. 
you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet uh, somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in as well. And please keep your questions of a biblical nature. That's, that's what we're all about here at the chapel, the Bible. And you got a prayer request, we can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to, to make time each day to talk to your Father. And He is your Father. You are His child. And you know, He loves you. He may or may not love what you're doing, but uh, contrary to common teaching of the church today, He's not a God that sits up there looking uh, somebody to zap because they step out of line or mess up. He is a God of love. He does love you. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, financial difficulties, uh, problem marriages, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these and we lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. Chris in California has our first question today. Do the two witnesses bring the last plague? In Revelation chapter 11 uh, verse 6. Now, while the two witnesses uh, will certainly have the power uh, to smite the earth with all plagues, as it states there in Revelation chapter 11, verse 6, I don't believe that those, that those plagues will be the last plagues. Uh, the last plagues will occur in Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. They're called the vials of God there, and they are the vials of His wrath. Uh, in verse uh, 2 of chapter 16, the first vial poured out is a grievous sore on all those with the mark of the beast. Chatterin or Catherine, I'm not sure which you know, on Florida. Uh, after a divorce, the Bible says you're not to get remarried unless you can not withhold from your desires. I've been seeing a man for five years. I've known him for 12 years. We want to get married, but I don't want to put this before God. I need some help with this. Well, make a note of John chapter 8, verse 1. And you had some uh, Sadducees and Pharisees who caught a woman in the very act of adultery. They brought her, I don't know why they didn't bring the man if he, they were caught in the very act, but they said to Jesus, you know, the law of Moses says that this adulteress should be stoned to death. What do you say? And Jesus bent down and he wrote in the dirt, and it's not written uh, what he wrote in the dirt, but one by one, you know, the accusers, uh, got up and left. And when Jesus rose, he said, where, woman, where are thy accusers? And she goes, I don't know. And he, she said, well, I, they don't accuse you, neither do I go forth and sin no more. Jesus has the power, the point of me saying all that is, he has the power to forgive. And so if you have a divorce, divorce, don't, don't misunderstand me, is a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, it hurts people, it hurts children, uh, it hurts financial welfare often. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible thing. But uh, if you repent of everything that you had to do with causing the divorce and you obtain forgiveness, then I believe God forgives and you can go forth, uh, remarry and be happy. Divorce does not make Christians second-class Christians. Uh, uh, some people try to uh, make members of their church second-class uh, Christians if they're divorced by saying you can't be a deacon, uh, you can't be a bishop, you can't be a Sunday school teacher. Uh, you guys take the seats over in the back over here. Aaron in Pennsylvania, 
who are the 12 tribes of Israel and where are they today? Are they the people that come over on slave ships? I'd like to know. Well, uh, the nation of Israel split uh, after the reign of Solomon. Uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam <clears throat> received only two of the 12 tribes. Uh, Jeroboam received 10 of the tribes. And things rocked along, well, I started to say well, fairly well, uh, depending on who was king. But uh, the 10 tribes went into captivity to the Assyrians 200 years before Judah and Benjamin went into captivity to the Babylonians. Uh, after they were freed from the captivity to the Assyrian, they went north over the Caucasus Mountains, becoming known as the Caucasian peoples of the world, uh, migrated into Europe, and then later migrated into North America. That is where Israel is today. If you think Israel is only the uh, geographical area of the, the nation in the Middle East at this time, you're mistaken. Uh, the people are Israel, not a geographic area. <clears throat> Timothy in Kentucky, please tell me if Pastor Murray has a Masera for sale at the chapel. And no, we don't uh, offer the Masera. Uh, number one, if you don't speak Hebrew fluently, the Masera is of no use to you other than possibly you could find it interesting uh, looking at the uh, structure of it, uh, but you know they're they're number one, number two, they're hard to find and they're very expensive. And and again, unless you speak Hebrew fluently, what use is it to you? We do offer uh, a Green's Interlinear Bible, which is taken from some of the best manuscripts. Uh, oldest manuscripts and as a translation by Dr. J. Green. Uh, immediately, and you also have the Hebrew, which is written from uh, right to left, backwards to what we write English, which is left to right. But under the Hebrew, in the three first volumes, which cover the Old Testament, uh, you have the English, and the English is keyed to the Strong's Concordance, which is a benefit. Uh, you know, and it's a four volume set, and uh, if you are interested in the Masra, that might be something that you would be interested in. Uh, I, I recommend that people first obtain a copy of a companion Bible and a Strong's Concordance, because if you have a companion Bible, and a Strong's Concordance, you really have all you need to do in-depth study with the chapel. Uh, I'll mention one other reference work that you might consider before the Green's Interlinear Bible, and that's a Smith's Bible Dictionary. Uh, that, in my opinion, pound for pound, is the best value uh, that we offer in our library because it's only $15 and it contains a wealth of information. Uh, in preparing for my teaching uh, on the air, I use the Smith's Bible Dictionary a lot more than I use the Green's Interlinear, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, Barbara in Pennsylvania, third request. Well, it's your lucky day. Question, in the five months when Satan is here and we can't buy or sell, we barter with neighbors for things food, and they are devil worshipers. Isn't that worshiping Satan in an indirect way if I barter with those neighbors? No, I don't see it that way at all. Uh, the, the key is, Barbara, don't worship the Antichrist. And to obtain his funny money, uh, the one world uh, currency, you're going to have to worship the Antichrist. Uh, we're not going to worship the Antichrist. Uh, therefore, we're not going to have, <clears throat> excuse me, any of their funny money. So 
the trees are blooming in Arkansas and the allergy season is upon us, so uh, bear with me and we'll make it through this. But I do not see bartering with someone who has obtained some of the funny money by worshiping Antichrist the same as worshiping the Antichrist. <clears throat> Jennifer in New Hampshire. Uh, thank you for your kind comments. I understand that all prophecy regarding Christ is given in days, while prophecy regarding Satan is given in months or moons. Revelation 22 verse 2, when describing the tree of life, states it yields its fruit every month. Uh, is this because Satan is no more at that time, so all is reclaimed by our Father? Please explain. And that's a good point that you make there. And, and I think you explained it well, that uh, Satan is already in the lake of fire at that time. So uh, it won't matter whether you're talking about days or months or what. And you know, and I think it's verse, you mentioned chapter 22, verse two. I think it's verse four or five there in Revelation it states that there will no more be need of, of a candle. Uh, there will be no more darkness, in other words, uh, because why? Because uh, our Heavenly Father is the light. So there will be no more day or night or moons or months at that time, which would be another uh, possible explanation for the fact that the, the fruit of the tree of life is monthly. <clears throat> Michael in Florida. I was wondering about blasphemy. I know what that is, but when people say God all the time, uh, is that the same as blaspheming the Holy Spirit? No. Uh, and you know, the use of the name God is not blaspheming our Heavenly Father. Uh, we say the word God as we're teaching His word uh, quite often. That's certainly not blaspheming our Father. Uh, you know, in, uh, in the old times you had a group who were responsible for translating the Word of God. And it, I think there's 134 places in the Old Testament that in an effort to protect our Heavenly Father, they change the name that he's called by, trying to protect him. I, I don't, I don't see the point. You know, uh, to know God's name and use it when you're praying to Him, uh, I would think He would be would be pleasing to Him. Uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You can read about in what Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 10 through 13. That's for one of God's election when they're called up before the synagogue of Satan to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them. That is the unforgivable sin. I don't believe it will be uh, possible for any of God's elect to commit it. Greg in Arkansas, one time at the very end of your show, you got a letter asking you if our Lord Jesus was made lesser than the angels in heaven. You ran out of time, but you said, yes, Christ being from the Godhead, this means that Christ is God also. You're right, Emmanuel, God with us. So please explain how can Christ be lesser than the angels? I love you so much, I know you have the right answer. Well, I hope I have the right answer for you, Greg. I think I do. And that is while Jesus was in the flesh, he was lesser than the angels. You see, God expected each of us to come through the flesh, be born of woman one time. And, and he was willing to do so himself as the son of man. As it states in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And that is your answer. While he was in the flesh, he was lower than the angels. He's certainly not lower 
than the angels at this point in time. Why? Because he's at the right hand of God. Katie from Alabama, <clears throat> thank you for your kind comments. Would you please explain 1 Kings 13th chapter? Uh, I like to understand. I would like to understand why the prophet that came out of Judah, uh, when he was deceived by another prophet, why was that prophet uh, had to die, killed by a lion, because he thought it right to go back and did eat bread and drink water. In chapter 21, said he had disobeyed the mouth of God. And that's the lesson. If, if what someone says is not what God instructed you to do, do what God instructed you to do, not what some man uh, said. And um, that was his sin. He, he disobeyed God. Uh, Antichrist is coming soon. And you know what his M.O. is? He lies a lot. It's going to be like a flood of lies, according to God's Word. Uh, Revelation chapter uh, 12 uh, will document that. Or, uh, yeah, But he lies a lot, and you want to be ready for those lies, and you want to do what God says, not what the Antichrist says. Dale in Illinois, I enjoy your lessons and have listened to them for some time. I was listening and you mention a time I was thrown off base about Acts chapter 3, verse 25, when Pastor Arnold Murray brought up the cre creation of other women on the sixth day and the creation of Eve on the eighth day. Can you tell me more about where he got this explanation? Well, if you're familiar with the creation, of Genesis, you know that in chapter 1, verse 26 and the following verses, that God said there, let us make man in our image. Uh, there were people created at that time. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, the first few verses, and then came the seventh day, the Sabbath, and God rested. Uh, then God created the man Eth Ha Adam. I speak in the Hebrew language, which with the article the man Adam, and uh, then uh, He created Eve from one of his ribs. Now, it's Im biologically impossible for all races of people to come from a man and a woman who are of the same race. That's biologically impossible. And, you know, we're often accused here at the chapel of being racist because we teach the truth about the creation. But uh, uh, truth is truth. And then uh, we'll teach God's Word uh, as it reads, and, and especially in the manuscripts, uh, and let the chips fall where they fall. Marie in Texas, do we know what starts the ruckus in heaven prior to Satan getting kicked out. Uh, thank you again. I now have a 24-hour station, and we're glad you have access to the chapel 24-7. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 is what Marie is talking about, and all we know is what it tells us there, that uh, there was war in heaven, and uh, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Uh, Michael and his angels prevail and boot Satan out onto earth. And it's woe unto you on earth at that point in time. Kim from Pennsylvania. Um, I have been studying your teachings for 11 years now and have tried planting seeds in the past. One that I planted nearly 10 years ago has finally started to take. As of now, every other Wednesday night at Bible study, it is being taught the way I tried teaching them 10 years ago. They know there is no rapture, Satan is coming first, and all the things you taught me. Uh, my question, now my question is, 
why did it take so long for the seed to start growing? Well, everything is on God's schedule. Uh, you know, He has a purpose and we should always pray for His will to be done. And it was His will that that person's eyes not be opened up and their ears opened up for 10 years. And I certainly am not going to question uh, why that would be. And that's kind of what you're doing. So uh, be careful not to question God. Trust in Him. Have every confidence in Him to do what is right. He always does what is right. Terry in California, are you teaching that only the hundred, are you teaching to the elect, the 144,000 only? And the answer to that is no. Uh, this program goes into millions of homes around the world and we teach uh, Jesus Christ. We teach people to repent of their sins. We are careful to point out that there are some who have free will uh, Christians, there are some who are his elect. They do not have free will. And there's a difference, but we teach that difference. Uh, where does the body of Christ, the church, fit into the non-rapture teaching? The church will be right here on earth when Antichrist uh, is here. That's the danger of so many being deceived. And people are being set up from the pulpits that should be teaching God's Word to be deceived. Where does the church go and how do we come back as uh, the army of saints? The uh, church doesn't go anywhere, those who are alive in the flesh. The saints who return with Jesus in Revelation 19 are our families, our ancestors who have already passed on. I'm way out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. And you know what? It makes his day when he looks down and he sees you studying the letter he wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.